This program is presented by University of Good evening. I want to thank everyone for, for coming to our uh, symposium um, very much. I'm Maurice Garcia, uh, one of the uh, urologists here at UCSF, and I lead the uh, transgender genital surgery program here. And um, we've, we've, uh, I've put together a, a symposium with my colleagues, and I have Dr. Dan Karazic here this evening and Dr. Jennifer Hastings here this evening to give talks. Uh, Dr. Karazic is going to speak first, so I'll introduce him first. Um, he's going to be speaking about you know, preparing for surgery, uh, mental health, and uh, primary care issues related to transgender uh, genital surgery. Um, and um, Dr. Karazic, or Dan, is a clinical professor of psychiatry here at UCSF. Um, he's a, a psychiatrist uh, for the Transgender Life uh, Center program here in San Francisco at the Castro Mission Health Center. Um, he's a co-leader and co-founder of the UCSF Alliance uh, um, uh, health program for, for the a gender clinic here in San Francisco as well. Uh, and he's a partner uh, with me and colleagues for our multidisciplinary uh, transgender surgery program here at UCSF. So we, we work together uh, as a team. Uh, he's a board member for, U, uh, for the um, World Professional Association for Transgender Health, or WPATH, um, which I think we'll talk about at some point, uh, some of the many resources they offer. Um, he's the past president of the Association of Gay and Lesbian Psychiatrists, and he's a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. My other colleague speaker tonight uh, is going to be Dr. Jennifer Hastings. Uh, Dr. Hastings is an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine here at UCSF. Um, uh, she is a family, uh, a practicing family, uh, a practice physician uh, in the Santa Cruz. In Santa Cruz, she started, uh, in, interestingly, the uh, transgender health program in Santa Cruz at the uh, Westfield uh, uh, Planned Parenthood Center in 2003. Um, and she's currently working uh, with many Planned Parenthood centers across the country to bring educational uh, out, you know. Uh, outreach and services uh, to, tra to Planned Parenthood centers across the country. Um, she is one of um, one of her focuses is on uh, adolescent, you know, gender issues in adolescent medicine in in, uh, in, in adolescent populations. Um, she is a um, uh, member of the uh, medical advisory board for the UCSF Center of Excellence for Transgender Health. And uh, she's on the steering committee uh, for the UCSF a Child and Adolescent uh, Gender Center. Uh, and I, I also want to emphasize that she's also a partner in our multidisciplinary transgender uh, uh, surgery program. Um, uh, a lot of patients uh, get excellent continuity of care with Dr. Hastings in the Santa Cruz area. We serve patients from all over the state. So we work closely together, and I'm very grateful uh, to be working closely with her uh, and together with her. So without further ado, let me present, for, uh, invite Dr. Hastings up to uh, go ahead and speak. Great. Thank you. Thanks for that my, my pleasure. introduction. And it's an honor to be here. I went to medical school here a long time ago, and it's really fun to be back. So we are hoping to talk, well, we will be talking about preparing for surgery, mental health, and primary care for the, our transgender and gender expansive and non-binary patients. This is an area that's changing quickly. So I'm thrilled that this is going to be televised and be shown, but I want to say the date today, which I believe is November 2nd. 2016. So this is not uh, going to be an accurate program in perpetuity. This is a field that is rapidly changing. Language is changing fast. So this is accurate for today. 
Um, usually I do a lot of talks now, and every single time I do a talk, I change the PowerPoint because the language changes so fast. So, so neither of us have any financial benefit from, actually we work very hard and uh, have no commercial involvements, nothing to disclose. And everything is pretty much off-label still, so that's important to note. So we have some pretty lofty objectives, but we want to look at current sex and gender affirmative language, concepts and terminology. I'll go through the basics of hormonal treatment and just really name the surgeries. The next uh, evening together here in the mini-series, we'll be going into depth in surgery. So this will, uh, we'll just essentially name them and, and then talk about some of the issues related to preparing for surgery. And Dan will focus on mental health criteria for gender-affirming surgery. And then if we have time, we'll dive into some of the uh, challenges faced by both patients and by providers. And then I have some slides on well care for gender expansive clients if we have time. So I think gender is something that we don't really take, we don't kind of delve into or investigate until someone, either ourselves or someone we know dearly or someone in the media steps outside of gender norms. And certainly in the last few years, with uh, Transparent on our TV series and uh, famous people changing their gender, we're just becoming more conscious of the complexity. What really is gender? What is male? What is female? And the concept of sex and gender minorities has really risen to, uh, to the consciousness of both our federal government and our states, meaning that, uh, for example, this is a federally protected status to be a, a sex or gender minority. In addition, we have legal protections in the state of California. If you're watching in another state, you have to investigate what the protections are because not every state has protections for sex and gender minorities. Our Affordable Care Act expanded coverage for uh, gender minorities. This was, this radically changed how we practice because before the Affordable Care Act, in general, gender confirmation or gender affirmation surgeries were not covered by insurance. And we have in California what's called the Gender Non-Discrimination Act, and that's really a foundation for benefits for patients uh, in terms of both medical care and uh, care. Uh, and you know, when you walk in the world in the state of California, theoretically, you're protected. So this is just diving a little bit into healthcare reform, and Dan goes into much more detail about how, that, how this changed in San Francisco. But essentially, more LGBTQ, gender non-binary, and gender creative people were able to get care. And Section 1557 uh, of the Affordable Care Act specifically prohibits discrimination based on gender identity or expression. And that's really the basis for the funding for uh, gender surgeries and for medical care for transgender people. So what about this acronym, LGBTQQIIAAAA? And the, you know, we get new um, letters in this acronym um, perhaps every couple months. And that's something that I actually celebrate and I'm very happy about because that means that more <laughs> identities are being recognized. So we'll just walk through the, the acronym for a moment. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, might be another Q, intersex, I, and then A for ally, but also A for androgynous, A for asexual, A for agender, and I'm sure there's some that I'm not mentioning that exist. So in this acronym, you have both sexuality, the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and queer is also a sexuality or a sexual orientation, and then you have gender with transgender, and so that may be some of the root of some t of a of an oftentimes there's a confusion between sexuality and gender identity, and I want to kind of explore some sex and gender basics so that folks are kind of clear about the distinction and the overlap because they both exist. So when we think of sex, we really kind of think of you know, what happens when a baby is born? And we have those pictures, you know, boy or girl? That's usually the first question. Or if someone says that they're pregnant, oftentimes, now that we have ultrasound, you know, is it a boy or a girl? Well, as you'll see tonight, in that, you know, um, genitalia don't necessarily determine 
uh, one's gender identity, but in terms of sex, we think of male or female based on physical anatomy or chromosomes, but then gender identity is actually something you have no idea, meaning it's probably in someone's in internal experience, some deeply se felt sense of self as male or female, and as I'll explore, somewhere in between or around or outside or both. So gender identity is maybe more complex and something you cannot know unless someone tells you or shares with you in some way. So you have no idea what my gender identity is. And I'll, I'll actually share that um, I actually don't uh, connect to the, to the pronoun she anymore. I've been on my own gender journey. And so I'm right now most comfortable with Jen. And I should have shared that with you, Maurice, <laughs> for my introduction. Actually, now when I write my bio, I don't put a gender in because I'm not really in a gender right now. Gender expression is what we share with other people, at, you know, pink or blue. Pink right now in the US is what we think of as traditionally female. But when Roosevelt was born, actually pink was the male color. And so you know, this, this astounds many people because they think, my gosh, pink forever. That has to be, you know, pink is female. Well, no, actually it isn't. Uh, it is right now in our culture. Um, but gender expression is really the external presentation of masculine or feminine or somewhere in between. It's really how we wear our gender or how we share it with other people. So now let's go into a little bit about sexual orientation, which has its own complexities because sexual uh, orientation includes who we're attracted to, what we actually do, or our behavior, and then also our sexual identity, meaning uh, maybe what we say to the world our sexual orientation is. So sexual orientation is completely separate from gender identity. Now, of course, they overlap because our sexual identity is um, connected with other people. and. When we use the terms lesbian or gay, that has an, an implicit assumption about what our gender, our own gender identity is. So we'll maybe a little bit la later go into the concept of someone who is transgender and what is their sexual identity or orientation or behavior and how would we describe that and talk about it. And I just want to point out that in the literature, historically, when you look at academic journals, about um, a transgender person's sexual orientation, my understanding, unfortunately, is that the sexual orientation described was often referring to the person's gender assigned at birth in relation to who they were sexually active with. And so that's a real confusion historically in the literature and something that we have to be very um, <laughs> conscious of when we're describing sexual orientation. And if, there's a question about that. Um, that. When we get to the end of this section, that would be fine. So another important point about this is that sexual identity actually doesn't necessarily describe someone's sexual behavior. And we know this historically. Um, for example, a heterosexual male says, I'm heterosexual, but that person that man may in fact be sexually active with another man. And that is described actually as gay. But his identity is not gay, but his behavior is. And so we don't want to make an assumption about someone's behavior based on someone's identity. And this is incredibly important if you're a clinician. It's really just important when we're with each other as people not to confuse the two. So another way of sort of looking at sexual orientation and gender identity is to say um, uh, our sexual or, uh, orientation or erotic attraction is who I go to bed with, and gender identity is who I go to bed as. And that's a little bit cutesy, and I'm not really a cutesy person, but I've shared that, and many people have said, oh, that, uh, that now I get it. I didn't get it before. So I'm a little reluctant about cutesy stuff. But speaking of cutesy stuff, here we have the gender unicorn, which has morphed from the gender bread person. And um, if we had a whole day together, like a workshop to explore uh, gender, we would take ourselves through the exercise of exploring within ourselves, well, what is my gender identity? What is my gender expression and presentation? You, probably know your sex assigned at birth, and who am I attracted to, and who am I romantically attracted to. So where do I fit on these, on these arrows, which are very you know, linear, right? But in fact, identity is rarely linear, and usually is more spherical and more multidimensional. 
And I like this image because it brings us some of the complexities and overlapping of identity. And the other point that this brings up is gender fluidity. And actually, that also um, is true for our sexuality. Many people find that their sexuality changes as they go through life. So let's go back to transgender or trans asterisks, which is a, the asterisk really connotes or denotes the, the broad range of identities that fall with under the, or within and under the transgender umbrella. And here are just a few, so gender fluid, agender, bigender, two-spirit or three-spirit or androgynous. But basically transgender is gender identity or gender expression that's different from the sex assigned at birth. And this concept of sex assigned at birth is the res currently, and this may change, I'm sure it will change, is the respectful term to describe what the gender that was perhaps between the legs or pe what people thought that someone's gender was, as opposed to saying natal male or female or real male or female. Sometimes there's, it's hard to find language that is truly respectful, but currently the most respectful term is sex assigned at birth. So what about cisgender? Some of you have probably heard that term. It's coming up more in the media and um, comes from the Latin roots of uh, cis, where, which means being on the same side of. So if, um, Maurice, your uh, gender was assigned male at birth, and in fact your current gender identity is male, you are a cisgender man. Um, and so that is useful uh, when describing um, and distinguishing between um, identities. Stealth is a t concept that is, um, goes in and out of being considered respectful, and it's uh, basically when someone does not want to share their transgender status or their trans status. In the healthcare arena, we often have people coming into our health center who are transgender, but who do not want to share that when they come into the, to the office or to see their provider. And it's only in a context of safety and trust that someone will share that in fact they're transgender. Intersex is um, something that I think is not well understood. Many intersex people have shared with me that um, they didn't find out that they had an intersex identity until they were um, older adults or in, uh, when they were teenagers. Um, there was a practice uh, in the 50s and, and further when people had felt shame or parents felt shame about this and did not want the rest of the world to know. An intersex person may or may not identify as trans, so it's sort of an overlapping um, identity. But basically, um, intersex conditions are not always evident at birth, and there are many, many um, different kinds of intersex conditions, and it actually merits a whole mini-series on its own, an Osher evening on intersex. So let's go a little more into trans terminology. So a trans man or someone on the trans mas masculine spectrum would be someone who is assigned female at birth. And in fact, AFAB is an acronym that's used. And um, that f uh, female to male, that's another, or F to M is another acronym that's actually, we're using much less. It used to be maybe 10 years ago, basically what the terminology we would use for someone who is transmasculine, and we're really not using that as much anymore. It feels more respectful to say trans man, transmasculine. That person might be on testosterone. And likewise, a trans woman or someone assigned male at birth, or AMAB, um, might be on estrogen or spironolactone, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then gender queer is a whole range of identities that include sexuality, which lie outside the binary, so a, a mix or um, not, neither male nor female, neither, not in the binary of male and female. So I just want to spend a little bit of time on the out of the binary because we're really seeing more and more. I would say um, maybe a third of the people that I see now are out of the binary and really don't want to be in one box or another. And um, September 26th in Santa Cruz, we had the first person get a non-binary designation on their driver's license. So it is coming. I think we're going to be seeing more and more non-binary people um, begin to have more space in the public arena and maybe on your 
Next application for a credit card, it'll you know, put MF or an NB for non-binary, or maybe it'll just go away, which might be the best. Um, and gender neutral pronouns are becoming also more and more common. The most common, um, well, so there's they, here, or zir, and those are just some. And I have this graph, of sort of the handy guide to pronouns about how to conjugate your non-binary pronouns, and really they is the non-binary pronoun that's taken uh, the most hold. And for you uh, English scholars and grammar nerds um, who say, but they is not singular, you now stand corrected. The son's John McIntyre, he writes a, a column about grammar. His, this is just a little clip from his his piece where basically they is now formally a singular pronoun and acceptable in the English language. And Chaucer and Shakespeare used they as a singular pronoun. So I have, I have a lot of um, young uh, people in my practice and um, just a little great story of one, a gender uh, non-binary student wrote their essay for their final. Uh, with using they as a um, singular pronoun, and they got, I think they got like a D minus or something, and this young person took Chaucer and Shakespeare to the English professor and got marked up to an A. So, good story. So, there's a um, rich tradition and many other uh, cultures for non-binary, and um, so both in our Native American tradition and in the Hegira from India. And um, yet, being a non-binary person in our culture is not easy. Uh, from BuzzFeed, what people say to gender non-binary people versus the subtext, which is, you're an inconvenience to me. And people do feel burdened when someone says, would you please say they, or you know, not say he or she. It is, it is hard to ask, and I now know this myself. Um, I want to encourage you to uh, explore this film, Three to Infinity, which um, really explores this concept more. And I'm going to jump now to something that I saw is on Dan slides as well. But basically, there's a, a report that came out in 2011 called Injustice at Every Turn, a report of the National Transgender Discrimination Survi Survey, where we basically finally got the data that we knew was true, which was that discrimination is pervasive in every part of our society. Employment, housing, healthcare, public accommodations, and the rate of HIV is exponential in our, gen in our transgender community, and up to eight times if you're a person of color. And this data of 41% attempting suicide, I think the more recent data for young people says 46% compared to 1.6 of the general population. So this is tragic, and this is one of the reasons that we need to have lectures like this so people begin to understand and you know, begin to look inside and question whether if you find yourself meeting a transgender person that you treat that per person with respect in your work and in all aspects of your life. In healthcare, that same um, survey gave us data that I think was actually conservative. I think more than 50% of people had to teach their own provider about basic trans health. We didn't learn about this in medical school. And that's just beginning to change. So the other concept that I think is important is intersectionality. So, and that's basically the concept that um, different categories of, of social and cultural oppression or axes of identity overlap and our oppression and discrimination all co is connecting. So as healthcare providers, I think it's really important for us to understand this concept of intersectionality, which was this whole concept was born, you know, in looking at um, oppression of women and race, but I think extends to gender identity. So let's now go in a little bit into what transition looks like. So there are different kinds of transition, not everyone Trend, you know, every, not every person chooses to have gender surgery. Uh, psychological transition is just what's going on inside me or a person in terms of thinking about transition, accepting it. Social transition is sharing it with the world in terms of clothing or hair, name. Legal transition is changing your legal documents to reflect your gen change in gender and name, perhaps. And then medical and surgical transition, which is what we're really talking about today. Not everyone does transition in the same way. Everyone's path is unique and is their own, and there's not one way to do it. And it may not be sort of back and forth between a Ken Barbie type scenario. 
this is kind of a useful uh, idea for someone who's exploring their transition to sort of look at the different aspects of what transition might evolve, involve rather, and then sort of cut out these pieces of paper and move the order around and figure out what's right. That said, many times people change as they are um, in transition. So one person might say, oh, I would never have surgery. And then two years later, I'm ready for surgery. So it, it's not a static thing. And um, we won't have time to go into what non-binary transition looks like, but it's, it's there, and we're finally getting more information out to providers. Because a lot of providers will say, you know, we'll be uncomfortable if someone doesn't want to, like, go all the way, like, dress completely female if they're transitioning to female or be entirely masculine. So I think it's important that we educate medical providers that people don't have to be, you know, go from one stereotype to another. So in the big view of of transition uh, hormonally, basically if you're a transgender woman or trans feminine, you need to, you'll need to have to overcome testosterone. Testosterone is a more powerful hormone than estrogen. Um, so you'll need both estrogen and then an anti-androgen, so something that lowers the testosterone. And then people may or may not choose to do progesterone in addition. On the trans male spectrum, it's much simpler. It's just testosterone. So all you need is testosterone, and there are different ways uh, to get that. And going back up to um, the feminizing, you'll see there are different formulations for estrogen. We basically avoid an oral form of estrogen. We want to avoid um, that form of estrogen that increases the risk of blood clots. Um, yeah, and the, this, this is where things get a, can get a little more complex when you think about what level, what dose. Um, we're, I think we're learning new things. I feel like we're kind of at the beginning of really understanding um, dosing. But it's very clear that for someone who wants to transition hormonally, that, that taking hormones improves outcomes. And this is very impressive. If we had anything like this, in the, like in any kind of approach um, that was be studied that had this degree of um, success, um, it would sell like hotcakes. So it's really impressive what hormones do for someone who wants to transition hormonally. Um, the surgeries, um, in general, if you're a trans woman, you could have removal of your testicles, which is the archaeectomy, the vaginoplasty, which is the creation of a vagina, typically with the, the penis itself, inverting the penis, or you can use a section of intestine. Labiaplasty, which is the creation of the labia using the, tes the testicular tissue. Some women choose not to have a vagina, but just to have the labia. Breast augmentation currently is typically not covered by insurance, but many women feel it's an important part of their transition. And then facial feminization, which likewise is typically not covered by insurance, but often important. And then the, re the removal of the Adam's apple with a tracheal shave. So that's most the most common surgeries. For trans men, chest reconstructive surgery is probably the most common procedure. Hysterectomy or oophorectomy, removal of the uterus and the ovaries, again, not not required, we, we believe, in terms of health. Many times people had the impression from the internet and from medical providers that for their health, if they were on testosterone, they had to have the removal of the uterus, that there was a risk of uterine cancer. That's not, we don't believe that that's true. So, so a, a trans man can keep his uterus and be feel that he'll be safe. A metoideoplasty is the creation of a penis and testicles using local tissue. The clitoris enlarges with testosterone and really becomes um, a very usable, typically usable phallus um, with the enlargement of it and the release of it from the, from the pubis surgically. Then the phalloplasty is a creation of a penis and testicles using tissue from other areas, typically the forearm, um, the side here under your uh, armpit there, and then sometimes the thigh. Silicone is something that's um, used for by people who don't have access to surgery, um, and it was more common in when surgery wasn't available. There are a lot of risks um, with using industrial grade surgery, and something we really worry about and really talk about with our patients, encouraging them not to. Um, go to a pumping party, for example. We've had a couple of deaths um, in the Sacramento area because of this. So that um, leads me to...
Dan, thanks so much. We'll just lead right into the mental health criteria for gender affirmation surgery. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. Well, Jen did a lot of work for me. Um, I'm going to talk about what we do uh, in psychiatry in assessing people who are uh, seeking transgender surgeries. Talking about why there's so much attention on uh, trans surgeries now, why UCSF is doing surgeries, and, um, and so many academic centers have gone back to um, involvement uh, with trans surgeries, which basically is that there's money for it now. Um, in 1981, uh, at the start of the Reagan administration, the federal government deemed transgender care experimental, and that formed the basis for insurance exclusions um, for trans care that uh, have lasted up until just the last few years. San Francisco was really a pioneer in uh, starting to provide uh, surgery coverage and removing the insurance exclusions for its employees, uh, for city employees in 2001, and the University of California followed suit, and so did a number of uh, private corporations and other universities. <clears throat> and then San Francisco led again in 2012 in, in adding um, uh, transgender <coughs> surgery to the services provided in Healthy San Francisco, um, which uh, is uh, San Francisco's um, uh, um, health coverage for uh, low-income people that preceded um, the Medicare Medical expansion uh, under the Affordable Care Act. And so in, uh, in 2012, uh, we in San Francisco um, started um, doing assessments uh, for people with um, who are uninsured and then people um, under um, Medi-Cal expansion, which happened in 2013. And at the same time as Medi-Cal expansion with the Affordable Care Act happened, uh, just shortly thereafter, um, the uh, state of California's uh, Department of Managed Health Care um, announced that uh, transgender health exclusions, which were still on most people's insurance policies, uh, were against the law in California and removed them from all state regulated uh, insurance in California. Uh, the following year in 2014, uh, Medicare uh, uh, dropped its um, uh, exclusion of uh, transgender surgery um, and the uh, Department of Health and Ser Human Services reversed uh, its 1981 uh, uh, decision that trans care is experimental, still challenging for in terms of access for people with Medicare um, in terms of getting uh, trans surgeries. Uh, and then in uh, the, the, under the Affordable Care Act, uh, proposed, uh, proposed Rule 1557, which be, then became instituted um, as Rule 1557 just in May of, uh, of this year. Um, uh, will do for the rest of the country what um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, state of California's uh, uh, Department of Managed Health Care and Department of Insurance has done for California, which is lifting um, insurance exclusions nationwide. So with that, we've had um, a really rapid um, e uh, expansion in the population of folks that we've been assessing um, for um, uh, for transgender surgeries, and that includes uh, a lower income uh, population than we had had in the past, where people uh, either had to have coverage under private insurance and and thus people who were employed, um, or had saved up tens of thousands of dollars in order to have um, uh, in order to have surgery, uh, in order to pay out of pocket for surgery. And so with that, um, we now are providing surgery for very low income people um, and including people with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders, people with a history of trauma, societal discrimination, people in unstable uh, living situations, some people who are homeless or marginally housed, people who really um, have uh, a lack of resources. Uh, compared to uh, previous populations that we um, were evaluating for surgery. 
Um, this is one of the um, settings in which we do um, evaluations for surgery. This is the gender team at the UCSF Alliance Health Project, which does uh, evaluations um, for San Francisco residents with Medi-Cal. And uh, this kind of team approach has um, a allowed a, a big expansion in capacity in terms of um, uh, people doing these assessments. Um, uh, this slide is just to remind me to say that not everyone uh, seeks surgery. Uh, the percentage of uh, the population that identifies as transgender um, may be uh, zero, um, 0 0.5 percent, one in 200, or perhaps more. Uh, from uh, a number of um, uh, epidemiologic um, surveys, and that's much larger than the number of, um, uh, of people who've had surgery. So and next I'm going to talk about uh, the framework for which for, uh, we do our evaluations uh, for surgery, which is uh, Standards of Care uh, Version 7 of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. Um, I'm a, one of the co-authors, one of 34 co-authors of the Standards of Care, which are an international consensus um, on uh, um, uh, principles and guidelines um, uh, for uh, the care of transgender people. WPATH um, uh, puts out um, Standards of Care 7 um, as a free download at WPATH.org, and you can go to WPATH. Uh, .org um, and, uh, and download uh, this as a PDF uh, and learn a lot about uh, trans care um, without having to pay anything. Um, we also um, put together international and American conferences. Our next uh, conference is an American conference, uh, the US PATH conference in Los Angeles in February. Um, we just had one in um, our an international conference in, in uh, Amsterdam. So uh, WPATH puts out um, uh, guidelines uh, that, uh, or standards um, that, uh, uh, that we use in, in determining if uh, people are um, eligible, essentially, to have, uh, to have surgery. And in doing that, um, we are, have been gatekeepers um, of a sort. Certainly, we've had that label. And um, it's important, as I describe how we do those assessments, that we keep in mind that, um, that gatekeeping has a, uh, a mixed history, um, really a long history of um, both paternalistic and binary assumptions. And you've learned a little bit today already about binary assumptions and uh, a feeling on the part of patients that there are a series of hoops that they need to go through. Um, and um, in doing so, um, uh, can have excessive weights and expense in terms of uh, getting these assessments um, and um, problems with uh, access to care. And that there is uh, a limited evidence base be behind the criteria. It's more um, been a... Um, consensus of, uh, of common practice. <clears throat> and we have to be um, particularly sensitive uh, to um, our role with a patient population that, as Janice also mentioned, has had really negative experiences with healthcare providers over the years, uh, refusal of care, harassment, violence, uh, lack of provider knowledge. Uh, and this is an editorial I wrote for LGBT Health, uh, Protecting Trans Rights uh, Promotes Transgender Health, and uh, about the link between uh, tra uh, tra uh, discrimination against transgender people and its uh, health consequences. So uh, with uh, version 7 of the Standards of Care, the first version was in uh, 1979, and so it's been revised periodically uh, since then. The biggest change we made was in the elimination of psychotherapy or living in the role of the opposite sex in order to get hormones. So we eliminated a binary assumption. We eliminated a, a criteria that didn't 
necessarily, a couple criteria didn't really nece necessarily have a good evidence base, especially because primary care clinics um, were starting people on hormones without using the, uh, these criteria with, uh, with good results. Um, and made the, the essence of, um, uh, of starting people on hormones the presence of uh, persistent gender dysphoria and the ability to give informed consent. Um, there is, is mention about co-occurring mental illness and if present that it be reasonably well controlled. So this informed consent model was, um, uh, was made part of uh, standards of care seven and, and so rather than there had been a period of time in which really there were two consenting model, two competing models for starting hormones and now they've um, been integrated under standards of care seven. So um, our letters, the letters that we do um, uh, are consultation reports to the surgeons as well as necessary documentation for insurance coverage. And uh, we, we try to get necessary information um, for uh, best outcomes for, um, uh, uh, for the patient um, for, uh, to provide information that a surgeon might need um, for their own assessment and care of the patient and to establish a relationship where the surgeon can, um, uh, can contact us if further information is, uh, is, is needed. Uh, WPATH Standards of Care 7 requires one mental health assessment for chest surgery and two for genital surgery from uh, knowledgeable uh, mental health professionals. Um, and the essence of the criteria for surgery is persistent, well-documented gender dysphoria, capacity for informed consent, being of age of consent for adults, um, and um, uh, and that um, medical or mental health concerns are, uh, have been well controlled um, at the time that people are, are referred forward for surgery. Um, uh, social transition is uh, only a criteria for uh, for genital surgery, for vaginoplasty, metoidioplasty, and for phalloplasty, um, and not for other surgeries. Uh, hormones um, are uh, not a prerequisite for chest surgery for trans men. It's often the first surgery that people have, or the first intervention people have, even before hormones. And um, uh, but for genital surgery, uh, 12 continuous months of uh, hormone therapy, unless it's uh, clinically not indicated, is, uh, is one of the criteria. And so there's a desire for people to have spent some time uh, uh, living hormonally um, in the kind of hormonal milieu that they will be in uh, post-operatively um, before having surgery. And it's felt that, um, um, particularly for genital surgery, that both social transition and hormonal transition um, for this year period uh, gives kind of a test period uh, to try to reduce the, the chances of regret. So the letters that we write um, are um, letters that are uh, addressed to the surgeon and it says who we are and um, our relationship to the patient, patient's history of gender dysphoria, what treatment they've undergone. Uh, we talk about social transition and uh, for genital surgery that they've um, spent a year on, uh, on hormones and living in the current um, gender role. Uh, we talk about um, any co-occurring conditions, mental illness and substance use. Uh, in particular, um, nicotine, uh, tobacco smoking is uh, these uh, uh, substance of abuse that's um, uh, most strongly associated with uh, poor outcomes in plastic surgery. Uh, and uh, so sometimes there's work to be done uh, with the, the, the patient or client in terms of uh, addressing nicotine abuse as well as uh, other uh, substance abuse uh, and, and stabilizing any co-occurring, for example, depression or other mental illness if it's present. Um, we assess them for their, their capacity to give informed consent, their understanding of the risks and benefits of, of surgery. We have a fertility discussion. Uh, this is something that um, we're paying a lot more attention to now. There are, um, 
I think it's on the, the minds of more and more of our um, trans uh, patients. Um, more trans men who are having babies, uh, more trans women who are uh, freezing sperm, although um, that's an expensive proposition that many of our patients uh, uh, can't afford, unfortunately. And then um, with our doing many evaluations on low-income people, um, we have even more emphasis on what's actually important really for, for everyone, which is uh, psychosocial stability, that people have um, uh, stable housing uh, and, and support from others in the um, perioperative period and, uh, and a plan for how to take care of basic needs um, during that period. Um, we, um, we give a, a diagnosis of gender dysphoria, which um, allows insurance payment uh, for the surgery um, and that they meet uh, the standards of care seven criteria. Uh, we state that the surgery is medically necessary because that's another um, catchphrase that insurance um, wants to know. Um, insurance distinguishes medically necessary surgeries from uh, cosmetic surgeries, essentially, in terms of what plastic surgeries they will cover and what they won't cover. Um, and and I, I request that the surgeon contact us if more information is needed, again, establishing a relationship um, so that if there are any concerns or problems along the way uh, that we can communicate. Uh, so uh, for uh, for genital surgery, there's a, ses a second assessment that's an independent assessment that's similar. Um, I think that there's a chance in standards of care eight that that second assessment could go away. Um, so um, next, I wanted to just show you an, uh, a form that's an uh, example of uh, doing an intake for someone who comes in uh, seeking surgery to just give you an example of uh, some of the things we ask people about. So we ask people, um, obviously, what surgeries they're interested in, and then uh, a little bit about their decision-making process. We want to get an idea of, of uh, you know, how long they've been thinking about a particular surgery. Some people may go in seeking one particular surgery but end up uh, later deciding uh, that a different surgery is, uh, is best for them. We asked them a little bit about uh, planning and expectations and um, uh, and coping um, with, uh, with stress. Uh, under gender identity and gender dysphoria in this section, you see no, question number nine is, how do you identify in terms of gender? And it's a blank line. And so we don't, um, um, we try not to put people in boxes. Uh, we try to um, get a narrative in terms of, uh, of how people identify. And we asked them about the development of, um, uh, of that difference between their internal sense of gender and their assigned gender. Um, and whether they've come out to others, uh, what their relationship is like with their body. Um, different people have different levels of distress with their bodies. For some, um, there can be, in, uh, for example, intense discomfort with genitalia, and other people really don't have uh, discomfort at all with their genitalia. Um, and uh, so what steps they've taken already? And uh, uh, we take a detailed sexual history, um, because that's something that um, will change with surgery, with genital surgery in particular. And so we want to know. Um, uh, a little bit about uh, the role of sex in, in the person's lives, and that really varies from, um, uh, you know, a, a, for example, a trans woman who has a penis and wants to retain it and, and use it, to uh, people who are asexual and and uh, uh, you know and really don't um, have uh, uh, really any connection with their genitalia at all. We ask people about medical history um, in, in, in detail, and we want to make sure that people are um, medically stable, and also about mental health history and substance abuse, and in particular, tobacco smoking. Um, and, um, 
And then we asked them about their uh, supports um, and, uh, and aftercare, and really tried to get a good sense of uh, what that process is going to be like for them. When we refer people for surgery, uh, sometimes the waits can be a year or longer, and so um, we're trying to project out um, uh, so, sometimes well beyond the time frame that uh, that the patient or, or, or you know or we really have any knowledge of what what their housing situation is going to be like, for example. Um, uh, so that's it's it's challenging and, and it's helpful for us to have an ongoing uh, relationship with the uh, with the patient through the uh, through the process because um, uh, certainly uh, psychosocial uh, situations can be in flux. So um, before I um, wrap up this part of the talk, I just wanted to wanted to talk about a couple. Um, controversial things that people have heard about um, uh, surgery. There's, there have been some uh, people and forces, really a, a small minor minority and not people who are um, really active in the field, um, who criticize uh, uh, transgender surgeries um, and have used this particular Swedish study um, as a part of their criticism, and in particular this number right over here of 19, um, which um, uh, is a this hazard ratio for suicide in Sweden um, for um, trans people who've been through their transgender surgery program versus the general population. And that the, the, the suicide risk being 19 times greater. Now, you've already heard that. Um, uh, 41 or 46 percent of uh, trans people, um, most of whom haven't had surgery, may have made a suicide attempt compared to a very small fraction of the general population. And so really, um, uh, a lot of this uh, suicidality um, is present um, in people who haven't had surgery. But this, uh, this particular study has gotten attention because these are all people who have had surgery, and in, in Sweden, they um, they can follow people's health and morbidity and mortality data through for, um, through a lifetime uh, in a way that we can't in the U.S. Well, um, uh, one of the interesting things, though, about this is that even though um, uh, from 1973 to 2003 um, there was this 19 times uh, um, risk of of suicide that uh, if you look just in the um, latter half of the study from 1989 to 2003, uh, the difference was not statistically uh, significant. And so um, it, what, um, in, in speaking to the author of the study, um, it appears that in the early years of transgender surgeries in Sweden, both the outcomes were not very good and uh, societal discrimination was higher. And now, with better outcomes and more societal acceptance, um, the the risk of suicide has is oops, it's approaching that of uh, of the general population. Uh, another way to look at this is the regret rate, and this is from the same author um, looking at 50 years of trans surgeries in, in Sweden, and they have a very strict definition of regret rate, which is. Um, People, in, at, until recently or through this study, you had to, through these 50 years, you had to have surgery in order to legally change your gender in Sweden, um, which was not good policy, but gave them some good data, essentially. Um, and um, so they looked at um, the numbers of people who legally changed their gender back after having had surgery and changed, changed your gender and found, so it's a very strict def definition of, um, of regret. Um, and they found, though, that uh, in the early years, 27%, four out of the first 15, cha legally changed their gender back. But um, the number, the percentage keeps on dropping decade by decade. And by um, the last decade of the study, only one out of 360, so 0.3%, uh, legally changed their gender back. Um, so by that strict definition, it seems in recent years that regret is, uh, is quite rare. Now, there are um, 
uh, other definitions or other ways that you can think of both regret and uh, detransition, um, which detransition um, is somebody who transitions back, um, but does not necessarily have regret for uh, transitioning in the first place. And certainly um, there are some people and they've um, gotten more attention, I think, um, in recent years, especially um, with the internet, um, of people who transitioned and, and found that um, at least binary transition wasn't for them and, and they may have transitioned to a non-binary place or they may have transitioned back. Um, most of those are people who had just started hormones and then later decided to stop. Um, again, um, uh, regret for people who had had surgery is, is, is very uncommon from all measures that we have of it. So um, I just have a couple other things. This is just that um, a, a little bit from what Jen is, is, um, has talked about, which is about the spectrum of non-binary people. And it's something that's been recognized uh, in the DSM-5 um, uh, diagnosis of uh, gender dysphoria, that, um, uh, that this is uh, a spectrum and that the, the people who have who go on hormones and have surgery um, do not necessarily have a binary um, identity. And then, um, and that uh, for transition across the gender spectrum, um, people might um, present with discomfort about, um, uh, with the, the place that they are in the gender spectrum and might move to another place on the gender spectrum um, that's more comfortable for them and through either through social transition um, or uh, and or uh, hormones or surgery, um, but not necessarily uh, with a binary assumption of male to female or female to male. And um, with that, our approach is not to impose a, a given a narrative on the patient, but to assist them in finding their own path. So that's, that's all for my slides. Uh, Jen has a few more things uh, uh, that, uh, that they want to talk about. Okay, so thanks, Dan. That was really helpful, kind of emphasizing the changes in the international uh, standards. The one thing I'd say is that um, there are places in the WPATH that state that there may be times when it's appropriate for a minor to have surgery, and we're really working hard. State Medi-Cal, California Medi-Cal does not acknowledge that, and I have a couple of young people who really need surgery before the age of 18 in our in uh, the US, we start college, and a kid does not want to go to college and then have their surgery. So we're really arguing hard, and I may employ you to help me with that process, because um, that would be true for gender uh, genital surgery as well. To go to college and then have your surgery away from home really doesn't make sense. So I think that's one thing I'd say that I think is already built in the WPATH standards, but isn't highlighted. Some of the challenges faced by patients, I think it's important for us to talk about. We have Dr. Garcia here, who's um, one of the surgeons in the Bay Area, and we have not we have more than a year waiting list for people yes. for vaginoplasty and certainly for phalloplasty and metroidoplasty. I think it's up to two to three years for metroidoplasty or phalloplasty, right, depending. depending on the surgeon. Gender, the top surgery, just chest surgery for trans man, depending on the surgeon you go to, a really long waiting time. So that's a huge problem that we all face, both for the patients and then uh, the, uh, those of us referring to the surgeons. I feel really challenged by that. Even for surgeons with a lot of experience, complications are not un not uncommon. It's a, it's the chest surgery not so much, but the genital surgeries are very complex. They're long surgeries. They're often involve um, microvascular surgery and um, just complications happen and the patients need to know that. And the, I work with the same population that you do, Dan, and for folks who have a lifetime of trauma, dealing with a complication in a surgery is just really hard. And if you don't have social support and financial support, this is really, really hard. One of my dear patients had a vaginoplasty and I didn't realize that she didn't have running water. She was living in a in a tra in a, a like a van. To not have running water and to heal with from a vaginoplasty, it's really it doesn't it's not viable. But I didn't know and I didn't think to ask. So I think that's another issue is the complications. The I think um, one of the things I'm really working on with people now is 
even when you have a part of your body that you really don't like, that you don't have a connection with, like a, if you're having a vaginoplasty and so you, there's your penis, the, the, the process of learning to love that tissue before you have your surgery, I think is really important and improves outcome. Right, and one, one point there is that uh, if people have a vaginoplasty, they need to, um, to dilate um, continuously for the rest of the useful life of the vaginoplasty, essentially, that otherwise it'll constrict and, and not be usable. And so we have people who have so avoided um, their genitalia because of dysphoria about having a penis, and uh, or some people who are so disconnected from it, right. and so teaching people to be connected to their body is exactly. really important. It's crucial. Do you want to add something for that? Yeah, I, I think you both are making great points about the surgery. Uh, the first one about the complication rates, a female to male surgery has a fairly high complication rate because it's several stages, and I think it's very important to, uh, A, to manage expectations with patients, and building a good relationship with them to understand that there, there may very well be complications and that you're going to work on them together and that to reassure them that they have continuity of care with you uh, as opposed to a you know, surgeon you go to, you know, like a shop, and then you leave and so forth. Uh, so, so that's very important, managing expectations and, and, and being available to patients. The other is um, a point that you both, Dan just mentioned about uh, your body. Uh, a lot of people have such bad, some patients, not all, have such bad gender dysphoria that they're not familiar with the sexual function of their genitalia because they've avoided it for so long. And, you know, when I was in training in England, I, I found with the female to male population that the best predictor of someone unable to have a satisfactory sexual function after surgery was lack of sexual function before surgery. So I agree with you both. We encourage people to to self-stimulate, to, you know, work on some something acceptable with a partner to know how to use, how to stimulate their body so that afterwards when you the surgeon has rearranged things that you know, they know how to, how to really make it work optimally, so. Right, and I have a slide a little further down the road about that, and I think, um, so sensuality perhaps is also something that, that can be a pathway to sexuality. So if someone is really having difficulty with a sexual response, I think taking away the pressure from a focus on orgasm or sexual response and more just feeling good about myself and feeling good about my body, and that is not easy sometimes. So um, we just wanted to talk about those case, that, that, those issues. In terms of well-person care, I think one of the challenges we have right now is that it's really hard for um, trans and gender expansive people to find primary care providers who are willing to go on the journey with them and willing to expand their own minds and become caring providers. It's, this is really hard. I have people coming long distances because their local providers aren't willing. And I really feel this like very right. passionate <laughs> desire to train and people. This is wonderful work. Yeah, and I, I would say that um, for primary care providers, uh, the UCSF primary care protocols is a great resource uh, online, and really any primary care provider can uh, teach themselves how to um, manage hormones in a patient. And it's, it's a much easier thing, actually, than managing all kinds of other right. Right. conditions that, that Primary the care primary providers care do every do, every day. Right. Right. It's, it exactly. shouldn't be so mysterious exactly. Exactly. Um, that that one necessarily only can go to a specialist. And it's, trans people live everywhere, and exactly. people who live in uh, in rural or less populated uh, uh, areas shouldn't have to come to San Francisco or Santa Cruz to uh, right. to get exactly their care. Right. Exactly um, right. Exactly right. And and. W Dan was mentioning we just um, in June of this year, to June 2016, put out our essentially second edition of the UCSF Center of Excellence um, for Transgender Care Primary Care Protocol. So it's all there, it's online, and it's really accessible to anyone. You don't have to be a medical provider to look at it, um, but if you're a patient, you can share that with your provider and say, here. And we also are available, I think we our emails are there. I don't know. I think you can ask us questions uh, if, if you are a medical provider uh, watching this. The other thing is uh, just an awareness of trauma and that many people have had trauma. And I think as 
a primary care provider, that's an important um, piece of awareness to hold. And when we have trauma, and you probably know this really well, uh, Daniel Siegel's model of the brain, and when we were in trauma, we're, we're really not connected and we react differently to things. And so helping people get recenter, get back connected to themselves so that they can kind of hear yeah. what's being said. And, and we, we really have a task in terms of um, uh, training providers in trauma-centered care just generally, right. and it's be right. has become more of a focus in public health. Right. And I know uh, within San Francisco Department of Public Health, there's been a real effort to train right. people in trauma-centered care because it really affects care across the board. But yeah. for our trans patients, because there is such a high rate of people experiencing trauma from being a gender non-conforming child who's been bullied or rejected by parents, to sexual assault, to um, rejection in school and jobs, <coughs> and, uh, and really outright violence sometimes exactly. in those settings, um, uh, we, um, we're taking care of a, a, a population that um, uh, can have a lot of challenges being just connected right. to good to medical right. care generally. That's exactly right. Exactly. And the next point is basically to that it, well care involves sexuality, where, as you mentioned, we're really learning more about uh, parenting planning for trans individuals. Um, that's not something that was on my mind when I started 15 years ago, and now I discuss this with everyone. And there are many old, sort of trans men in their later 20s and 30s that didn't, you know, that thought, as I said, that they needed to have their uterus taken out for safety reasons, for health reasons, who are feel sadness that they weren't given the opportunity to explore their own desire for, for pregnancy. So that's really changed, I think. Um, so preventive screening is really pretty basic. If you have an organ, screen it according to the current guidelines. So that it's not that hard. You just have to be aware of what organs are present. And that brings back to the point I was making earlier about if someone is not sharing their their transgender status in a medical setting, then you might miss that there is a cervix to be screened um, or, or some other organ. And so this next slide sort of goes through the USPSTF um, cancer risk. So that's the United States Preventative Task Force Cancer Risk and Screening. So if a transgender man has had chest surgery, he doesn't need a mammogram anymore. If there's a trans woman who has been on hormones, we wouldn't start her screening uh, for, we, we think, at least five to 10 years of being on hormones if she's like over 50. So you wouldn't start screening her at age 30 just because she's on estrogen. Um, that's at least our current belief. And we don't have a lot of um, evidence to support our recommendations, but we're trying to get that evidence. For um, pap smears, for cervix and anus, you basically follow the same guidelines. There's no difference if you're on hormones. For the uterus and the ovaries, as I said before, there's no evidence that you have any increased cancer risk with, with, horm with testosterone. And the pros it, so being on estrogen doesn't change the prostate screening guidelines. Um, some people think that you have to do a prostate exam on every trans woman at every visit. And no, you don't do that for cis men. So there's, you don't have to increase the screening if someone's on estrogen. Um, sexuality and gender, I think you mentioned already really well that sexuality behaviors may shift. Colt Meyer has a great study from 2013 showing that 40% of trans men, uh, their sexual um, behavior changed after using testosterone. This is something I really wanted to get to. This is um, a wonderful guide just put out um, in July, I believe, from a collaboration between the Whitman Walker folks in Washington, DC, and the Human Rights Campaign called Safer Sex for Trans Bodies. And I think this is re a really important um, uh, piece of work both for providers and for patients because it really it explores in depth, you know, language and concepts and how do we use our bodies and what feels good and it's a really lovely, lovely um, piece. Here in um, at UCSF there's been work done on um, um, pre-exposure prophylaxis on right. PrEP yes, for, very tran important. for trans women and certainly um, with trans women are an at-risk group for HIV and, um, and should be encouraged 
uh, to start prep if they have if they have risk. If behavior. they're at risk, right? And that's been a wonderful um, development, I think. And UCSF has been a pioneer. Um, so safer sex. What does sex look like? I think it's important to to think about and how do we talk about it in a way that's respectful but also in, gives information. So thinking about safer sex, I think, is, is really important. And then the family creation options is really something we didn't think about when we were starting to do this work about the importance of exploring uh, future fertility and pregnancy and being involved in pregnancy. And I just want to point out a, a um, lovely article called Family Creation Options for Transgender Nonconforming People. Um, that was just put out in the Psychology of Sexual Orientation and Gender Diversity this year. Laura Dickey, great, great stuff. So youth is something that I do a lot of, um, working with younger, younger folks who are exploring gender. And we have something available now that many of our older patients didn't have when they were go starting puberty, which is puberty blockers that basically um, can put puberty on pause. So if you have a young person who's aware, you know, aware that they may not want to go through the puberty related to their gonads, we have, uh, you know, sort of the miracle drug that we've used for years for um, pr what we call precocious puberty or early puberty. And basically, this puts um, puberty on pause, and then there can be time for exploration for the family um, and the kid. And then you can start your cross hormone if, if everything is going into place. And I love this slide. Is it a boy or a girl? I don't know. They can't talk yet. And that's kind of a, a nice way to, to sort of hone in on what gender is, is that it's really an internal experience. And family acceptance, we're, we have, I think that Caitlin Ryan presented in this series earlier um, in the in sex yes. September here. Her work is absolutely crucial. And, and just so it doesn't matter how old you are, whether you're, you know, eight or 12 or 20 or 40, you're, the acceptance of your family really makes a difference. And if, if any parents are watching or grandmothers, love your kid. <laughs> it really, we have the data now to show that your children do better. And I think that is the end of the content. And I'm hoping we, well, so we have 10 minutes still if there are any questions. If not, we can go through the resources. You are a very lovely audience. Good, I see a hand. Right, so I think the comment was that, that maybe youth right now are coming to awareness earlier than previously. I'm not sure that's true, but when kids are expressing now, and they're not being shut down the way they were before. So I think in the past, like in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s, if, if a, a young person said, mommy, I'm a, I'm a girl, and that person had a penis, mommy would say, you're a boy. Now mommy will go, oh. Oh, okay, I've, I've heard about this and won't shut down the child. So it really, I think we, I mean, I want to, I'm hoping that we're having more um, social acceptance for gender exploration. Um, in terms of uh, children, um, so um, one, of the, one of the trends that we've seen is um, more um, early social transition in children. So more children who are, Presenting to their parents as having um, a, um, uh, a, a, a strong um, identification um, with, uh, often with the other um, the other gender, um, and sometimes it's non-binary, and um, and more uh, permission in um, from parents and um, from schools of those. Uh, uh, children being able to express that difference um, early. And um, there was um, some powerful data from uh, Christina Olson, a uh, psychologist at University of Washington, uh, studying these kids and showing that um, for these um, trans kids, these kids with, um, uh, with uh, transgender uh, gender identities, so not, not just um, gender nonconforming, but um, with strong um, cross-gender uh, identification, that those with um, supportive parents who are allowed to, uh, tra tra uh, to transition uh, uh, socially um, have um, 
uh, similar mental health to uh, to children who are not trans, uh, to, to cisgender uh, children. And this is very different from um, uh, gender nonconforming children generally um, who have tended to have more mental health problems. Um, and so the feeling is that in particular for those children who really have a, uh, a strong um, cross-gender uh, identification, um, that having a supportive family, a supportive school, a supportive society really can make a world of difference in terms of their mental health. Um, they're not, um, people are not typically having um, surgery until much later uh, in life. So surgery is even, even though there are there is surgery in minors, uh, chest surgery, for example, for um, <clears throat> uh, for uh, uh, trans uh, boys who did not get on um, puberty blockers in time to prevent uh, breast growth, um, people assigned female at, at, at birth. Um, and that um, quite commonly now happens uh, before the age of uh, 18. Um, genital surgery um, uh, is happening to some degree in, um, um, in people under 18. Uh, Christine Milrod um, has a paper that's in press that I'm also an author on, um, uh, interviewing surgeons about practices um, in, in those under 18. And, and that certainly um, will be a, um, a topic, I think, of, of more debate and discussion. Mm -hmm. So I think what Dan is, and I'm, I'm not sure we're answering your question specifically, but I think the, the data that we presented with you about the high rates of suicide, the um, discrimination that uh, many trans people experience, with per family acceptance and the youth being able to follow their path we're not we're beginning we're it's looking like those individuals will not have those high rates of depression and difficulty accessing employment school housing etc so we're it's really just a profound shift in what we're seeing with that parental and family acceptance it's really powerful and so in, in addition to um, uh, Christina Olson's uh, data, um, there is um, interesting data um, from Amsterdam um, of um, uh, children um, who were given um, puberty blockers and then hormones and then surgery, and then they followed up with them after surgery, um, finding very good mental health right. um, outcomes similar to the general population. And that's very different from, for example, the old Swedish, you know, the Swedish data from past decades. And it, just the idea that um, that children can end up leading normal lives and, and, and not happy, happy, and lives. happy lives. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question, yeah. So we, we don't have a list, but um, Dr. Garcia has been here at UCSF doing vaginoplasty. Have you been, I don't know if you've been doing um, some phalloplasty, metoidoplasty, but sadly we're losing Dr. Garcia yeah. in the end of December, so that's mm -hmm. not good news for us. Um, we don't, were you inquiring about top surgery? No, top, those top surgeons. Oh, the, the top best, surgeons, the best I surgeons. see. Yeah, so th there's a list, there's not, in California, there's a handful of surgeons. Um, I think the Center of Excellence has a, a site of surgeons in the city in the area. You know, here at UCSF, we offer surgery starting soon at Cedar Sinai. So I'm just putting up here um, medical and mental health resources um, that doesn't necessarily have a list of surgeons, but this I think is a useful list um, f for some people who are in the audience. The Surgeons, Dr. Uh, Crane's office is great, um, and I think your family will be, your daughter will do, do well. There's also for phalloplasty, uh, Balbeck uh, Safa, um, okay. who was doing phalloplasties with Crane's group and is now um, on his own here I in San Francisco okay. at, uh, at Davies Hospital. Great. So there's the, the, the number of surgeons has been, uh, has been growing. Um, we happen to have, um, more surgeons really in the Bay Area than um, uh, anywhere else in the United States um, uh, doing these surgeries. So um, I would encourage you and your, uh, and your daughter to, um, uh, to um, you know, to speak to um, 
well, finding out who might be a preferred provider of, your, of insurance might be an issue, but speaking to, uh, to different surgeons and, uh, or speaking to other people in the trans community about their experience in terms of uh, deciding on the, um, uh, on the surgeon uh, for your daughter. So I think we got the wind-up sign. So okay. thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Garcia, for inviting us both. This was an honor and a pleasure. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much. Yeah.